I appreciate the fix. This is my second virtual presentation, but I've um, attended Fix Affairs back when they were in, in person. So super appreciative to be invited here today to talk to you about urban weeds. So we've all got them. And I'm hoping that you all can take away one practice from this presentation that you can implement um, wherever you'd like to garden. I think there's going to be lots of useful little nuggets. Um, but if you have questions, please just err on the side that I really enjoy to, to respond to questions during the presentation. So fire away. So there we go. So before we get going, I'd like to take the, a minute just to acknowledge that we are on land um, stolen from the original people of this region. The Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Satfalati, and Kalapuya peoples have called this region home since time immemorial. They are the original stewards of the land and continue, their wisdom continues to guide us all today. They are represented nowadays by different names than the ones I just mentioned before, but uh, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, the Cowlitz Na Nation, the Chinook Nation, and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians, um, just to name a few. So we are all here gathered virtually to grow in our own stewardship of land and pay respects to those elders. Um, but we also want to acknowledge the cultural erasure and genocide that um, took place and continues to take place against indigenous people of this region. Uh, this is a really cool um, website, native-land.ca, and you can look up the approximations of the historical ranges of different um, indigenous people. Oh, and the bar is, is where Portland is at. So here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to start with some definitions. What is a weed? Some other relevant definitions. Why should we control weeds? How we can control, how we can do it. We're going to break down sort of the bulk of the presentation uh, into, which is learning the different weeds into backyard weeds, those that are in waterways, those that are high alert that we should really be on, on the lookout for. And then offer a little tease um, about what comes next. So what do you do after you manage these weeds and what can you do to create um, backyard habitats? Then I'll reserve a little bit of time for questions and answers. And then you should be getting a link for evaluations in your inbox afterwards. So let's start with a poll question. So I'm going to launch this poll. And let's hear from you all. What is a weed? Is it A, a plant that spreads rapidly? B, a plant that isn't where it's wanted? C, a plant that poses considerable health or considerable hazard? Or D, a combination of all of the above? It's more to come in about. Sometimes, for whatever reason, sometimes polls don't work work for people. But if and if they don't work for you, just envision envision what the answer is. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll, and it looks like we're a little bit split. But a majority of us are saying, or almost a majority, fifty percent of us are saying, uh, a combination of the above, and that's what I would tend to say. A really common alternative definition is just a plant that isn't where it's wanted. I hear that quite a bit, but I think it misses some of the complexity of um, what weeds are. So I'd like to offer two definitions that are a little bit, is a plant that is considered a nuisance or troublesome that grows where it is not wanted and often spreads fast 
taking place of desired plants, or it's a plant that is considered a hazard or that causes injury to people, animals, or a desired ecosystem or crop. So I want to, I want us to think about weeds in, in both of these definitions because I really like how they offer two parts. They're kind of two-part definitions. So it's like, it's both a plant that isn't where it's wanted and it causes damage. Um, the second definition is more, I would say more of like an wanted, becomes a hazard and it damages crops. So it's both where it's not wanted and causes damage. So let's get into the weeds a little bit more. Non-native is used a lot um, when, when discussing weeds, um, but all non-native means is there are some synonyms which are kind of like have some problematic connotations, I think, but uh, exotic, alien, uh, non-indigenous. And usually when we're talking about something that is non-native, you have to specify a geographic region. So in, in the throughout the course of this presentation, if I use it, I'm referring to the Willamette Valley. Aggressive just refers to a fast moving or spreading plant. Importantly, aggressive can be a weed, it can be a, a non-native plant. Um, it can also be a native plant. So there are plenty of native plants that are aggressive and those tend to be actually really useful in a lot of cases. So not necessarily a bad thing being an aggressive plant. Invasive, uh, this definition I think is thrown a lot around a little bit willy nilly, I think. Um, it's a plant that spreads into an area where they are not native, there's one part, and they cause damage. So it's not enough to be just non-native, to be an invasive plant. I think it's a little bit overused. Noxious weed is the most specific definition we're going to talk about. It refers to a species or group of species that have been legally designated as pests. Um, and usually that government agency is the Oregon Department of Agriculture. So they are going to be the governing body in this region who decides what is a noxious weed. And you'll have, that'll be broken down even further between it's a class A or it's a class B noxious weed, etc. Before we go any further, let's talk about some plant biology. There are two main strategies, two main ways that plants can make more of themselves. And the first strategy uh, is vegetative reproduction. This, um, so if we take a look at this um, illustration with the white background, we'll see a bunch of different examples of vegetative growth. So in a potato, when a potato produces a uh, well, a potato. <laughs> a potato plant produces a tuber, which we know as a potato. That potato you can take and you can plant it somewhere else and it will be a clone of that potato plant. That is considered vegetally the same. Uh, onion bulbs do this, but they, you know, they form onions in, in clumps next to each other. Runners and rhizomes are interesting. Um, they're sort of horizontally growing root systems. They can be uh, below ground, so it'd be a rhizome, or they can be above ground, they can be called a runner or a stolen. And it's important to understand this because if you say you were to run a shovel in between, this is a, an illustration on the bottom right of this graphic of an iris. So if you were to run a shovel in between, uh, well, basically where it's labeled right there and cut that rhizome in half, you would produce two genetically identical plants. Um, and then there's sexual reproduction. So plants can produce seeds and they can produce quite a lot of them. <laughs> Interestingly, weeds, 
a lot of the time they tend to do both of these things very well. I think we'll see a lot of examples where it's not only that they produce tons of rhizomes, although it may be the case, but in a lot of cases they do both quite well. So throughout the presentation, I might just point out a couple of those times, but yes. So why should we control weeds? Why should we even be concerned at all? There are quite a few implications, but there are impacts on habitat and native species. So native plant communities um, that are kind of under siege from, uh, from invasive species because they take up a lot of, they take up a lot of space and they displace, um, you know, native animals to this region as well. So here we have an illustration of, or a picture, sorry, of Himalayan blackberries in the foreground. In the background, you just see, I think it's travelers completely taking up all of the ground space and it's climbing up into the tree canopy to a point where once these trees die, there's not going to be, there aren't going to be saplings that can push really easily through this, um, through this ground layer, the shrub layer of uh, Himalayan blackberries. So that displaces um, a lot of the native critters and a lot of the native plant communities. Uh, yeah, invasive species. And this is these, the effects from invasive species in terms of habitat destruction or um, in terms of habitat loss is second only to habitat destruction, to like paving it over. So that's pretty, pretty shocking, I think. So we want to be concerned about threats to native plant communities. And then there are broader, higher level ecological level impacts. So they're affecting both the living and the non-living components. So if we look um, at the photo in the top left, um, so we see a brush fire. Disturbance regimes can be altered by invasive species. There's an example of uh, cheatgrass in the, in, the, in the plains and to an extent in Eastern Oregon. And it is more flammable it produces, or it is, it catches fire more easily than the native plant communities. And it's also, its seeds are, are, are um, they germinate better after a fire event. So you can imagine the feedback loop that happens from the, from, from the plant getting established, then a fire sweeping through, and then the seeds disperse and then even more cheatgrass comes and that, that cycle just repeats over and over. So that's an example of how invasive species can alter the disturbance regime. Hydrology, so in the top right we see purple loose drive and at Oaks Bottom in Portland. And purple loose drive, along with like reed canary grass, they can kind of create where there wasn't land before. And they can cause water that normally was flowing one way to maybe flow back. So it is altering the way that water moves around an area. So it's altering the hydrology. In terms of geomorphological processes, um, we could think about um, erosion at, on the banks of rivers where say just Himalayan blackberry has taken over along the banks. So if we only have one plant's kind of root system, that's only going so far down into the soil to hold soil in place. So if we have fairly shallow root systems, so Himalayan blackberries have um, relatively speaking pretty shallow root systems compared to a diverse native plant community. And so as, so as the rains come and as, um, as the water levels rise in the river and start to sweep some of that soil um, away, it's easier to do that when there's not all those roots holding it in place. So then we start to see these, 
these channeling, this channeling happens where you get steeper and steeper banks. And again, a feedback loop because plants are having a harder time establishing on that steeper bank and it just keeps happening quicker and quicker. This is a normal process, but it's sped up by invasive species. And soil chemist plants can emit chemicals into the soil that prevent other chemicals from growing or other plants from growing near it. So for example, uh, garlic mustard is an example of a plant that will emit a chemical into soil which prevents native plants from growing near it or some native plants from growing near it. There, this isn't always a bad thing. This, it's called um, allelopathy. This is an allelopathic plant. Not always a, um, a bad thing and not only weeds do this, walnut trees are an example of a plant that uses that same strategy. And I don't know, I love walnut trees. <laughs> but it can, weeds can start to affect the living, uh, the living parts of an ecosystem as well as the non-living parts. So hopefully we're convinced enough to move on, but how can we help control weeds? I imagine that's why most of us are here today to learn about learn about that. So you can avoid purchasing potential weeds. You can control and remove the weeds wherever you garden. You can minimize their spread. You can volunteer. There are lots of great organizations that are doing good work. Um, also, the yeah, the city of Portland has volunteer events for like their no ivy day where they get crews of volunteers out to pull ivy. Tons of fun. You can attend a nature scaping class or, you know, workshops very similar to the one you're attending now and learn how to transform wherever you garden into something that is not only going to be uh, free of weeds, but somewhere that's going to invite wildlife, somewhere that's going to be a really aesthetic place for you to um, chill out and enjoy. So I'm going to talk about mostly the first three of those today. So how to avoid purchasing potential weeds. You can take a weed list and we'll provide that resource for you here uh, after the presentation. When you're buying a seed mix um, or wildflower seed mix in particular, you just want to cross-reference that with that weeds list. It's a good idea to not bring in any unwanted plants. So if there is a particular non-native plant, uh, an ornamental plant that you're interested in, it may be a weed. So you might want to take a second look if it has uh, several of these qualities below. So if it produces lots amount, large amounts of seeds, lots of berries, if it spreads by runners, underground roots or plant fragments, there's a lot of weeds that, that do the, that very well. And if it has a pest, or unusual kind of pest or weather resistance. A lot of weeds, I'm thinking about like English ivy or vinca have a waxy coating, which makes them totally unpalatable to deer. Well, I shouldn't say totally unpalatable, but they deer don't really like them. Uh, and lots of insects don't because they've, it, like the insects, if they try and eat the, eat lots of those leaves, like they basically get indigestion and they and they swell up and die. So you just want to be careful. It's not necessarily, it's not 100% certain that if you have, if you're eyeballing a plant that has these qualities that it is a weed, but just be cautious. And there are four main categories of ways to control weeds. I'm sure we're familiar with quite a few, but, um, already, but I'll go through them. Mowing, simply mowing weeds down. That is a way to keep the, keep the weeds in check. Hand pulling, cutting, and burning. So burning would be in an urban context, that would be using like a propane torch. And um, so there's, there's a brand useful for um, 
like if you have weeds uh, in your hardscape, like if you have your weeds coming up in between your um, the pavers in your patio, that can be a really good option, burning. Careful near the siding of your house. Also be careful if you're doing that uh, to do it in, you know, just after it's rained, that's a good time to do it. Don't do it under plants that you care about a lot. I've done that with like rosemary hedges. It smells really nice though. There are cultural control methods that would be like shading plants out. So if it's feasible, say you want to establish some trees or thick shrubs somewhere anyways, that may just do it. You may not have to do much weed control at all. You may be able to just put uh, a, a canopy layer, something that's gonna shade. Um, say you've got weeds that need sunshine. If you turn the lights out, then they're not gonna live there. You can also plant appropriate competitive vegetation. I think that's where a lot of like these, it's pretty useful to have some a more aggressive native species for this um, or ground cover. Lots of ground cover I think is totally underutilized. I know the least about biological control methods. It doesn't tend to be something that I focus a lot of my efforts on, but these would be things like parasites or predators or pathogens. So sometimes ODA, Oregon Department of Agriculture will introduce a, um, a type of insect that's gonna, I forget, there's a kind of caterpillar that only eats tansy ragwort, which is a problematic um, weed in this area. So this is typically a slow process. We've also got a picture of the goat brigade, which I think is really cool. Um, they can be really useful for kind of like one-time clearing, but you see they're eating some brush. If you don't have them back though, periodically, like the brush is just gonna grow back. And lastly, I would like to think of this as a last resort, um, chemical control methods. And this would be things like spraying, painting. Um, there are some other lesser used things like you can you can rub something on a leaf, like a like a wick sort of thing. And I will say it should be a last resort. Um, and the label is location directions and, and don't read the entire label. You just shouldn't bother. You should find someone to consult with um, a licensed pesticide applicator for the state of Oregon. That would be totally preferable. And I would also say, but there are some totally legitimate uses, I think, um, for, uh, for herbicides, don't get me wrong. But organic pesticides, I think we should be kind of careful with these because it doesn't necessarily mean that they're totally safe. Just because this is organic doesn't mean that you should uh, not wear gloves, for example, when you're applying it. So there's organic pesticides like um, I've seen vinegar that's in a really high uh, concentration. So the vinegar that we cook with is 5% acidity. So I've seen for these vinegar sprays and that is really caustic stuff. Like that can really hurt your skin. So you need to be um, very careful and take the same precautions as if it were a um, conventional herbicide. And those organic pesticides aren't, they don't tend to be, they aren't um, a lot of times as tested. So they're, the impacts to human health and to plant health are not a lot of times as well understood. So Agent, yes. This is, this is Harmony. We do have a, a question here. Great. Of, do you have any recommendations for mushrooms? Not exactly sure if those are a weed. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not as familiar with thinking about mushrooms as weeds. I can know they can pop up in like the fruiting bodies of mushrooms can pop up in a lawn. 
and then maybe that's not a desired aesthetic, but honestly, I'm not sure. And I, I would think that it's a totally uphill battle if you want to eliminate these things, because what you're seeing, the fruiting body of a, of a mushroom is just like a very small fraction of what is living under the surface. So I think, I would think that it's nearly impossible to kill um, all of the mycelium that are under the, under the surface. Yeah, I don't tend to think of them as weeds. Also, they're not plants. So no sorts of, like very few of the, of the control methods that we're talking about would apply. So anyway, I don't really have a good a good answer for you beyond that. I'm sorry. Okay, thanks for that. Keep them coming. Okay, and we can minimize the spread of weeds. So here we see this dog is all, its fur is all covered in these little seeds. So weeds are spread by humans and other animals, machinery and equipment, think car tires, lawn mowers. And they're also spread by natural processes, wind, water. And you can minimize your impact. And there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of reasons to do this. A lot of arguments to be made for leaving wildflowers in the, in the wild, unless you have uh, like a cultural resource permit. Let's say you're part of an in indigenous group and you're collecting culturally important species. That's legit. Um, you can clean the seeds from your boots, your bike tires. There are some, there are some like mountain bike trails now that have um, you know, bike tire washing stations, which is really cool. And there are all there are those boot brushes at, at some trailheads. So definitely use them. Takes so little time. If you're a boater, you can empty the bilge water and check all the crevices of of your uh, of the outside of the boat for um, harboring aquatic uh, pests. Whether those be whether those be plants or animals, you don't want to like. Let's just pulling error. Hmm. Oh, there we go. There we go. That should work. So, which of these weeds has yet to emerge this year? Is it A, Lesser Celandine, B, Herb Robert, C, Harry Bittercress, or D, Pokeweed? Which of these has yet to emerge? And I'm not sure if you can see the poll. So I'll just read it again. <laughs> Which of these weeds has yet to emerge this year? A, Lesser Celandine, B, Herb Robert, C, Harry Bittercress, or D, Pokeweed? So a little, couple more seconds. Good, good. Most so close the poll. Okay, yes, that's right. Most of us are on the right track. So pokeweed, it uh, it comes on, comes on in. Well, I guess we'll start seeing it probably the end of spring, but it really has its heyday in the summertime, end of summer, early fall. Lesser celandine um, is all over the place. I've even I've started to see some of it flower even at this point. So just depends. So let's get into talking about really like the bulk of this presentation, which is learning some of these weeds, uh, some of the identification notes. So first weed, though I often hesitate to put it in a 
presentation about weeds because it is really useful for humans and wildlife. Uh, dandelions, the important thing is if you don't want dandelions to spread, you need to control them before they set seed. Uh, and there are many tools that you can use. This is dandelion stomper um, with the white backdrop, the picture of the white backdrop. Super cool tool. You can, uh, I don't know, I think I could probably pull like 200 dandelions in an hour. It's it's really efficient. Um, it's got these metal metal spikes that you center on the dandelion. And as you center, or as you push it into the ground, the spikes close on it. And then pushing the plunger on the top, pull simultaneously pulls up and releases the spike. So it pulls out the tap root, tap root of the dandelion. So it's a pretty nifty tool and it also uh, aerates your lawn as you're doing it, because pulling out these tiny little um, plugs in the soil. If you're gonna do a lot of it, I would suggest taking like, I don't know, a small piece of wood or um, maybe even a brick because as you use the plunger it can really like it can really wear on your wrists if you're constantly just <laughs> so it's nice to have a um, something heavy to to press down on it but dandelions are good for lawn they they aerate your lawn which is something that people pay big bucks for lawn aeration services in the in the fall um and they're really great for pollinators. They're they're one of the first flowers of the year, uh, and so when when a lot of our native bees, including mason bees, are waking up, they need you know they need flowers to to forage pollen and nectar, and so this is pretty good source of them. So, but I can understand aesthetically if you don't want to tons and tons of dandelions. There's easy manual way to, or mechanical way to um, remove lots of them. Herb Robert, I don't have nearly as much love for. You wanna look for um, a fuzzy, fuzzy red stems coming from a central rosette. That is all the stems are coming from one central point. Uh, the, the leaves are very similar to those of a Pacific bleeding heart, which is a native species. All you have to do is look at the flowers, though, to different, differentiate those two species. And this is a plant that can eject seeds. So many geranium species, they can eject seeds. And these, these are capable of ejecting seeds up to 20 feet, little tiny seeds. Super easy to remove, hand pull it just before it sets seeds sets seed, I am starting to see it pop up like all over. So it's time to get on it before um, the soil warms up and it starts to flower. Probably the best identification thing about it is to crush the leaves and it, it smells awful. The, the, another name I hear gardeners call this is Stinky Bob. So that kind of is a dead giveaway. Shining geranium, another geranium species, but it doesn't have the fuzzy red stems. It has more glossy ones. The lobes on it um, are much different. They start out a green and they eventually become a pink purple. It also produces a five petaled tiny pink flower. And the seed pod being a geranium is that same beaked seed pod. And it can do the same trick, it can also eject seeds. Super easy to remove, really shallow root system, not a big deal to pull um, by hand. Pokeweed hasn't showed up on the scene, but it's, it's living underground right now. You wanna look for green or red stems with large, simple leaves. So simple, the difference between simple and compound, learning that about plant anatomy is just so helpful when it comes to identifying native or non-native species weeds. It's so useful to understand that, you know, a simple leaf is one that comes directly off of the stem, the stem or like the, the maybe the trunk even. 
and then a compound leaf has leaflets. So it sends, so it might have multiple leaflets on one leaf. So it's, that's a good thing to, to look up that will help you with your plant identification journey. But it, the dead giveaway for this plant is the berries that it produces in that, in that form. It kind of looks like, it kind of looks like a bunch of grapes sort of, but don't think of it that way and don't eat them because the, the berries are uh, toxic to humans. Birds spread them around by eating the berries, depositing their seeds. To remove them, it's not a big deal to pull the little ones. Just make sure to get the tap root, but when they get bigger, you're probably gonna have to use a shovel. So if you see that photo in the top right is a, just gives you a sense for the scale. That's like a regular pointed shovel. And these things, they just, yeah, they get to be the size of like large sweet potatoes. And they're really, really hard to get out without a shovel. Bishop's weed, I actually have, I've started to see a little bit come out. Hasn't come out in full force yet um, out of winter dormancy. You want to look for this light bluish green foliage and it almost always is variegated. In fact, I can't think of a time where I've seen it in Portland where it isn't the variegated form of this, though I'm sure it's out there. It spreads by the rhizomes creeping underground stems and roots. To remove it, you want to dig up the entire plant, including the soil around it, which is a total bummer, and you have to throw all of it away in the garbage, which is um, unfortunate, but that's just what you got, got to do. And then you got to track um, to see if it re sprouts. Right. So just a major tenant of weed control, I think, is intervening, doing some removal, seeing what comes back, and just staying vigilant. You stay on top of it, you can get you can get a handle on most everything with persistence. Lesser salandine, I mentioned that it's in some places it's already starting to flower, which is pretty crazy to me. But you want to look for dark green, shiny leaves yellow flowers with eight petals. That is a very good identifying feature, the eight petals. It, it grows, it forms these uh, pale bulblets underground. And they're just, yeah, bulblets meaning little bulbs. And they fragment super easily. So when you're pulling them out, you don't want to like, don't make the mistake that I have, like, digging a clump out and then shaking to get some of the soil up because the bulblets just, they just disperse that way. So it's best to just dig out a clump and throw it all in the garbage. Um, not in the, not in the compost, in the, just in the garbage. And it spreads by the, the rhizomes and these, and these bulbs. So let's, let's stay on top of that. Um, let's take a let's take a five minute break and I don't have an on-screen timer so you have to forgive me but um let's pick up the presentation at um 1 so I'll meet you back here at 1 to
Just give folks another second to come back to things. Join back up. Okay. All right. Let's get back to it. Let's learn some more weaves, shall we? But before we do, I'm going to launch this poll. Let's see if it'll work. Oops. <laughs> Right. Okay. So which of these have just recently, like within the next, within the past two weeks, which of these have started showing? Of course, this is going to depend on, because there's sort of regional variation, different microclimates, plants are responding differently, but We'll see which of these have just started to show above ground growth. Okay. Well, just two of us were able to vote, but I would say, again, this could depend on where you live, but I have noticed in my neighborhood in Southeast Portland, I have noticed Lesser Salandine has been around for a couple weeks now, and Bishop's Weed is just starting to come out of dormancy. So anyway, that's just what I've noticed. I think the important takeaway is to just pay attention to, to the cycles of things, because understanding the cycles are going to help you know when to control them, when to expect things. All right, so let's talk about weeds along waterways. Um, it's important to research aquatic plant species before you buy them. Many commonly used aquatics, think like lily pads or, um, or, or lotuses, or is it lotuses? Yeah, 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 those can be quite invasive. Um, you want to wash your plant introductions before you put them in the water and plant them because there might be some aquatic pests or there might be snails and you don't want to introduce those into a new area. You want to keep your water garden separate from waterways. Say if you, uh, if you garden really close to uh, a creek, you want to make sure that those are your pond and the creek are not connected by surface flows and never dump water garden materials or aquariums or any, anything like that into local waterways. That presumably is how Ludwigia came to, um, came to colonize much of the backwaters of the, the Columbia River system and the Willamette is because it's a species from South America, I think Colombia, and it's used in aquariums. So presumably someone just used it in their aquarium and then dumped their aquarium out. So not a good thing to do. Purple loose drive, something we see a lot of in the in the Portland area in this marshy habitat. Uh, to identify it, you want to look for square woody stems with um, little hairs on them. Magenta colored flower spikes are really pretty actually they make they have gorgeous blooms actually in the summertime they spread by the rhizomes and by seeding so it's an example of a plant that does both of those strategies we talked about at the beginning really well to i don't imagine much of us many of us will be dealing with these in our garden all the fragments i'm going to throw those in the garbage Oh, and that, that picture in the top right is of Oaks Bottom, the wildlife reserve in Portland. 
yellow flag iris, I noticed this uh, a lot in near like North Portland, Northeast Portland, the Columbia Slough area. There's a lot of it there. You want to look for bright yellow flowers um, with these cascading petals. Say like the typical iris form, but if you don't know what an iris looks like, that's what an iris looks like. Uh, it's got three-sided green shiny fruit when it does produce the, the fruiting pods. Um, I, lots of irises, not all of them, but most, well, a lot of them have flat fan-shaped leaves, and this is an example of one of them. Our native does not have a flat leaf shape. It also is much shorter, but that can be a way to distinguish. There are plenty of good ornamental irises that are not, not invasive species. It spreads vegetatively and by the seed pods. Another example of a plant that does both quite well. To remove, you want to remove it before it goes to seeds because if you're removing it while it has the seed pods on, you might just cause more of a mess by dispersing lots of those seeds. And you got to, uh, you got to dig out all of the root fragments when you're, when you're digging them out. You have quite the clump of roots and rhizomes. There's a photo in the top left of the seed pods, immature seed pods in the center um, produce viable seed. And on the right, that's just an example of the way that they colonize. And they kind of do a similar thing with in uh, marshy areas where they create more marshy land. They kind of create their own land, adapting some of the hydro, potentially uh, altering some of the hydrology. Tree of Heaven, also known as Stinking Sumac. I tend to call it more Tree of Heaven. Uh, it's a suckering tree shrub thing. Uh, it's got large alternately arranged. There's another plant anatomy thing that will help you so much learn the uh, difference between um, alternate and opposite leaf arrangement. That's a really good one to learn. That will help out a lot. And it smells of rancid peanut butter. Um, though I cannot, I, for what I must be missing something in some smell receptor because I don't smell it that much. Um, I just look more for the the leaf shape and that that suckering tree form. It spreads vegetatively and it also produces these winged nut produces these winged nutlets called samras. Kind of look like the the maple seed pods. To remove them, not a big deal to remove the little ones by hand. You can usually pluck them out. Harder if they're in kind of like in between the sidewalk and a foundation. That's that's pretty difficult. You can use a weed wrench for saplings or if they're a little bit bigger, might have to be a shovel, shovel removal, and then paint with herbicide. So also the root system, you you don't want to mess around if there are plants that are getting near your foundation because they can cause cracks um, in the foundation. They also can cause damage to sewers. So their roots are intuitively moving towards the running water. A weed wrench is quite the tool. It's really nifty, good for pulling out kind of these medium caliper um, shrubs and trees. There's an example of how it worked, but works. But as you are leaning back, those teeth cinch in on the um, on the base of the tree or shrub, and then you've got that good lever action to help you yank it out. It's good for uh, quite a few plants actually. There's what it looks like when it's really young. So these are its first true leaves right here. And then here it's weaseled its way into a brick wall. And this is the classic look. This is what I see in kind of the industrial areas uh, in around where I live in, in Southeast Portland. It just happens all the time, all the time. They, they love that colonizing those voids. 
And those are the samaras, those wing nutlets that I mentioned before. So those can catch the wind and spread that way. You could be forgiven if you were just looking at the leaves. You could be forgiven for mistaking it for a black walnut, but take a closer look at the bark and you'll see that tree of heaven has really smooth bark, black walnut, quite fissured, crevices and all that. Tree of heaven, the, the flowers look very different and the fruits are very different as well. The fruits are those, are those samaras. Meanwhile, the fruit of black walnut is a walnut. Yeah, it's this green, this green fruit with a walnut inside. English ivy, I think if you're familiar with any sort of weed, it probably is English ivy is, is uh, on your list of known weeds. Um, you wanna look for a vigorous woody vine. It's all over the place. It climbs walls, it climbs trees, it covers hundreds of hundreds of acres of the Portland area, I'm sure. It produces small white flowers in, in tight clusters and then eventually produces a dark, um, dark purple berry. It spreads vegetatively by leaf fragments and the seeds can also be dispersed by birds. To remove it, if it's climbing up a tree, it's best not to yank the vines out of the tree, even if it is kind of unsightly uh, to leave them there. It's best to do that because, especially if the vine wrapped all the way around the tree, because the process of yanking the, the vines off can damage the, um, it can damage the bark of the tree. And if you, if you damage the bark all the way around the tree in one specific area, then you could risk girdling the tree, which is a quick way to kill it. So just be careful when you're removing it from trees. And um, you can also, if you can't get a handle on all of the ivy, so you've got a really big patch that you just can't get to yanking at all, mowing it, cutting the cutting the flowers down with a with a weed whacker is, is a good way to just you know keep it in one in one space. There are a lot of commercial areas that I notice like um, where you know, landscaping maintenance service will just like come and mow it multiple times a year. And sure enough, it doesn't flower. It stays, stays put, you know, it's not the most ecologically beneficial thing that could be planted there, but eh, it, at least it doesn't spread. And when you're working with it, it's best to wear gloves because the, the sap from it can cause um, dermatitis, can irritate your skin. So it can grow to it can form quite the trunk, this vine can. Um, here's an example of, of like the, the window that a restoration technician has, has cut in the tree. Usually when you're doing it in a restoration con context, you're using a machete, whack, whack, you cut that window off and then, or that window out and then you paint, paint or spray um, that that cut stump with um, with an herbicide, and then you'll see in the top right, all of these all of these vines can actually go up into the canopy and they can shade out the tree canopy and they can kill the tree. In the bottom right, you'll see a classic scene uh, for like a volunteer event, like an ivy pole day. It can be really it can be nice to remove it in kind of 10 by 10 sections um, like squares and then just rolling it up and rolling it up and, and sort of piling it up if you have no way to dispose of the plant material is a decent way to limit its spread because anywhere where the root fragments are still touching the soil there's a chance that that plant plant could root again so just kind of balling it up limits that chance Old man's beard uh, or traveler's joy, really common one. Um, it's they still like you still see some of of these with um, just like no leaves right now, but then the seed heads are still hanging on in some places. But you want to look for a, a deciduous kind of woody vine when when the vines are a little bit older. It's got five leaflets, white puffy white flowers and then white puffy um, seed tails. 
complete completely blankets other vegetation is really um yeah, it can basically turn the lights out for some of these trees. And here we see it in the photo in the bottom right, of just they're climbing up the gutters, climbing up, uh, or yeah, up the downspout and then into the gutters even and anchoring itself in the siding. So you wanna get to it before it gets to that point. It spreads vegetatively and by the seeds, the seeds can catch the, the wind and, and the rain. To remove it, cut the you cut you cut the vine down. Then that's mostly just so you can like get a handle on where the base of it is. So you can dig around a little bit with your hands and find the base. And tugging at tugging at any part of this plant is maybe not the best thing to do because it just breaks. It, it fractures really easily at the joints. So it tends to be a better idea is just kind of, you cut back uh, maybe some of the top growth just so you, to the point where you can see the, the stems poking out of the soil. And then maybe get a shovel. In a lot of cases, it's like at least, at least a hand trowel to dig out some of these. If they're really established, definitely a shovel. And then if it's already gone to seed, if you can, if you can control it, you know, retrieve as many of those seeds as you can and uh, put them in the garbage. And I see that there is a question coming in. So someone asks, I have had touch me not impotens, capensis and watercress nasturtium officinalis, recently established them and now dominate my small mud bottom pond and wetland. Any advice to control these to control these plants? Yeah. I I know yeah, I'm not as familiar with these two species just because I don't do a whole lot of wetland gardening. But I would ask I would ask yourself you know, where is the weed pressure coming from? So is there a colony nearby? Is there a neighbor that you can talk to <laughs> nearby who's, you know, whose plants are getting out of hand and sort of creeping into yours? So that would be one thing. Uh, once you control them, it may be, because I'm not as familiar with these particular plants, but if you're able to hand pull them, that's, that's the first best option if you, if you can. Um, but able to um, hand pull that might be a judicious case of, of using herbicide to control them. And then, but an interesting thing also with kind of like the pond dynamics, the pond ecosystems that if you have a pond, you can kind of play with the water levels too. So if it's something that is only growing in um, only kind of like marshy, muddy land or whatever, if it's possible, maybe you could raise the water level of it and kind of drown, drown some of these things. That might be an option, but it is kind of like general advice not not specific to these plants. Oh, and if you if you do end up getting uh, a handle on them, just finding finding an option for something that's going to be really vigorous to compete with these species. So that would be also a really good thing to do. Though, yeah, I apologize. I'm not no like native wetland. Well, I mean, sedges and rushes definitely. So if you yeah, if you have, if you can get, I'm thinking rushes in particular, the common rush or um, dagger leaf brush, they like, they really form a rise, wetland, maybe getting a, getting a good ground cover layer established um, would, 
and planting competitive vegetation like rushes or sedges would be a really good way to get a handle on it. Yeah. So, but I'm gonna write that down because I need to, because I know impotence or policeman's helmet is kind of another one that gets out of control. So I'm gonna write that down. Touch me not. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, let's keep rolling. So Himalayan blackberries, probably, you know, another, another very common one that if you recognize some weeds, you probably recognize this one. Really common, thick red arching canes, a lot beefier canes than the than those that are grown for um, for food. A lot beefier than marionberries, a lot beefier than the whatever the thornless varieties of blackberries are, uh, and beefier than the native blackberry species, which we'll see a picture of. It's got large, uh, round, toothed leaves, so kind of zigzaggy leaves on the on the margins with five leaflets and it spreads by the stem fragments and the rhizomes and the seeds are dispersed by birds because birds also love blackberries just like we do. To remove them, you you can cut them down to a foot because that's just a really good way to be able to again to like kind of see what you're looking at and then you want to be able to find the crown. So probably going to be digging around a little bit with a shovel to use that shovel, use that lever action to pull that shovel or um, sorry that crown out of the ground and then once you've successfully removed those you can plant overstory plants to shade them out if it's acceptable in that location to to do so to plant thick shrubs thick evergreen shrubs would be best to shade out some of that some of those from coming back and just like I said before, tenant of weed control is just, you know, intervene and then stay tuned. You like keep monitoring, keep after it. And I, I've resisted for a long time buying my, buying pairs of leather gloves. And I, you know, I don't know why I've resisted so long. It like completely changes the mood when you're controlling blackberries. It can make it like a fun activity, or I think. Okay. Oh, just a response about the um, about the wetland weeds, the impotence and the watercress. I was thinking about trying uh, Juncus patens or or a blue rush. Yeah. So blue rush being the the cultivar from common rush. So thanks for encouraging me to plant rushes and changing the water depth. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and and it's so wonderful to have a, a wetland garden. It's such a different, a different kind of garden than uh, than most of us get to get to use. It's that's really fun. So enjoy. There's a picture of the berries. Yes, like we all need to know what blackberries look like. Those look delicious. Okay, now let's turn to look at some high alert invasives. So some that we should be really concerned about, some that are really aggressive. Spurge laurel is the first one. Um, produces yellow flowers with that honey-like fragrance. Produces, or after the flowers, it has the, the green fruits and then as they mature, they turn black. Um, a good way yeah, a really good way is to to ID them is to look for the dark greens, green leaves that are shiny on top and lighter on unside on the underside, and that they're spirally arranged around the stem. That is a pretty good way to tell um, if there aren't flowers or um, fruits at the point at this point. The seeds are dispersed by birds and rodents, but it also suckers, spreads veg vegetatively can do both quite well. Um, to remove it, you want to hand pull with gloves because again, it can cause dermatitis. 
and the larger shrubs must be dug out. There's there's no pulling those out. And if it's kind of a medium size, maybe you can get away with a reed wrench. And do not eat the berries because they are toxic to humans. Do not, do not. Unfortunately, I know people who have encountered other people that have. And it's really sad, but um, they establish really well in an understory of a woodland. And they're taking over one of my favorite ecosystems, which is an oak woodland, Oregon white oak. So total bummer. We we really want to do our part in, um, in urban areas so that they don't kind of escape and get out in uh, into our, you know, on the fringes out and out into natural areas. So let's do our part. Yellow Archangel. <clears throat> so fortunately, I don't see too much of this in, uh, in Portland, but um, to ID it, you want to look for variegated leaves, which are opposite. So on directly on either side, one leaf here. Uh, coarsely toothed edges and the flowers are kind of a dead giveaway. They've got that, I don't know, they kind of look like a jellyfish to me. That's those hooded flowers. It spreads vegetatively by stem or by the stems and potentially by seeds, mostly by, by the stems. To remove it, dig up the entire plant, throw the soil away and all of the root, root material and monitor for regrowth, regrowth. Just keep on it. And a way to weaken it uh, and then kind of sel more selectively pull out things would be to sheet mulch, maybe over the course of like a year. So that would be the process of putting, or yeah, and I think East Multnomah has got a great um, resource uh, on their website for like the lawn removal guide. And it'll talk about sheet mulching if you're not familiar. But so yeah, you put cardboard down or there's also this stuff called um, contractor's paper, which is kind of like a thick brown uh, craft paper kind of thing. And it comes in rolls. You just roll that couple layers of that over the weeds dump alternating layers of brown and green materials. So it might be like, oh, I don't know, uh, like six inches of wood chips, a couple inches of compost, then maybe straw or more wood chips on top. And just your final layer should be a brown layer. So plant material that is that has been dead for a while or that has been decomposing for a while doesn't have much carbon in it. Right. So, and, but stings are still going to pop up through, you know, it's, you've got a really vigorous weed if you're trying to sheet mulch a large area. So it's inevitable things will pop up and you just, but less will pop up and then you can just dig those clumps out and then cover that back over with lots of plenty of um, material. So it's discouraged from popping up again. Scotch broom doesn't tend to be as big a deal in like smaller urban gardens, um, but like along highways and, and whatnot, it's just, it's ubiquitous. It's a woody shrub with showy yellow flowers and it gets to 10 feet tall and it gets to 10 feet tall really fast. Um, it, when it's older, it has rigid bark uh, and it, yeah, it has tiny, tiny leaves. And the seeds form in these seed pods. I think you can see that in the top right photo. Yeah, so those hairy seed pods, um, those burst. And that is a way that scotch broom disperses its seeds. So it projects the, them from the pod. And they can remain, those seeds can remain viable for like up to 200 years, I think. So <laughs> pretty incredible, actually. Very impressive. Um, to, to remove small plants, not a huge deal. You can pull the plants by root, um, <clears throat> get the root. Larger plants, you can use a weed wrench. And if they're over two in diameter, you may, two inches in diameter, you may be able to dig them out. Um, but yeah, you, this might be a case of just like repeat 
repeat cutting or cutting and then painting with painting with an herbicide. Uh, they're also nitrogen fixer, fixers and they emit chemicals into the soil so um, that prevent plants from growing near them. They're allelopathic. Okay. Uh, did I mention Vinca yet? That is a question. Um, I have not mentioned Vinca and I'm not sure if in this abbreviated version of the presentation I will. So if I don't mention in this presentation, I will touch on it. Thank you. But first, garlic mustard. So garlic mustard is a biennial, so it completes its um, life cycle in two years, usually. Uh, it, the first year, it's a small rosette of round kidney-shaped leaves with scalloped edges, and then year two is when it bolts. So when the soil gets warm in the, um, in the spring, uh, in May, I believe, then it shoots up and it can get up to four feet tall, produces those white flowers, spreads by people, animals, equipment, cars along roadway, roadways, that's a big one. You can hand pull it when they're little, not a big deal. Just want to dispose of them in a bag and uh, throw them in the garbage because, yeah, you don't want to risk those being spread further. And they're also allelopathic. Hopefully we've learned that vocab word today. So the first year, they don't do much. They get, you know, inch, six inches tall, but then, uh, I'm sorry, March of the second year is when it bolts, not May. And they get pretty tall and it's not, it's not hardly worth removing them when they've gotten to this last stage of like the seed pods and the dry stalks, because as you're doing it, it just disperses more seeds. It just projects them, especially when they're dry just walking through them, just pew, 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 they pop off like fireworks. Japanese knotweed, it's all over, it's all over the Portland area, urban, urban gardens, it's everywhere. Um, you want to look for large leaves with hollow reddish stems. They kind of look like bamboo stems, not bamboo, but uh, they spread vegetatively. The root fragments, um, transport very easily and they remain viable for a long time. Uh, you want to cup to remove them. Honestly, before you do that, if you need help, if you're <laughs> at all like, how do I do this? You should definitely call um, East Multnomah if, the, if that's in your uh, your area or um, your service di district, sorry, or, or West Multnomah because they'll give you some uh, technical advice on how to control it, or they may even do it for you. Um, but they'll definitely provide advice for sure. But if you were to do it, um, you cut the canes back repeatedly and dig out the root system only if you can remove all of the root fragments because the process of digging it can create more of it. So, um, but I have successfully managed some patches with, yeah, with digging. Um, Yes, they weren't super established. They were maybe like a couple years old, but um, but yeah, it, and but it was quite the production. Like I dug down several feet, so <laughs> it's it's pretty difficult. And you want to throw away all of that material, package it up, throw it in the garbage. There's a couple different knotweeds in the area. I mostly see Japanese knotweed but you can differentiate giant Japanese and Himalayan just by their leaf shape. So Himalayan being the more lancelet shaped leaf and then um, giant being obvate, I think is what it's called. It's just oval shaped. There's a pencil for scale. It's class B noxious weed. It really establishes in unriparian areas. It's quite, quite vigorous. Oh, and then we see uh, kudzu. Thank goodness kudzu is not that much of a problem here in Oregon at this point, but um, kudzu in the Southeast and much of the United States, continental United States, just totally taking over. Sometimes called, sometimes called the plant that ate the South. So there's kudzu right there. 
So we have it a looks question. like we have an, another uh, question here in the comments of um, I somehow inherited Rose Campion and they seem to be spreading wildly. Are they a problem that should be treated as a weed? Jeez, you all are just throwing plants that I've, I'm not really familiar with. I apologize. Um, Rose Campion. That doesn't ring a bell as something that is as uh, something that is a weed that really you should control, but kind of a basic tenant of managing weeds is observing how it spreads. And so I would say if it, um, you know, if it is, so first, the first kind of red flag is like, did you plant it there? Sounds like no. <laughs> um, if they're spreading wildly, another red flag. And then the next red flag would be like, is it spreading into your neighbor's yard? Um, or have you, you know, have you tried to, have you tried to dig it out? And is it just coming back potentially even stronger? <laughs> so that would be, those would be some things um, that would be red flags that would say, yeah, this is behaving as a weed. And so it's both, so is it, is it displacing what you want to garden, what you want to plant? That's one part of that weed definition or invasive definition, right? And is it not wanted? So is it causing damage and is it not wanted? So if both of those things, you know, if checking both of those boxes, then I would say it's a weed and it sounds like you've got some, some red flags there too. So, so yeah, I would, I would just, uh, First of all, definitely keep an eye on it. And second of all, make sure it's not spreading into your neighbor's yard. And then I would recommend um, area of the of Oregon you're you're living in. Then you might want to contact East Multnomah or West Multnomah. So, right. But thanks. I will write that down. Y'all are y'all got some good ones today. Rose Campion. Write that down. Cool. So yeah, kudzu, we don't want this to get, get a hold a hold of our area. It's got three leaflets, purple pink um, pea-like flowers, pea-like seed pods, it spreads by the runners and rhizomes. Uh, just if you see it, if you think you see it, call 1-800-INVADER. That's the Oregon Department of Agriculture's noxious weed, excuse me, hotline. I would do that before I even consider mowing or digging out these things. Yes. Okay. So, all right. How much, Harmony, how much time do we have left? Time we check. have uh, just about 10 minutes. Just about 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad we, uh, we all came here to talk about urban weeds. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know something that I'm really really a fan of talking about but once you get a hold on things you should start thinking about planting native plant communities incorporating native plants into your landscape when you've done that extended site preparation required so you know native just means usually when we're talking in Portland, we're talking about the Willamette Valley region. So there's a lot of benefit in wildlife of this region. They don't require a lot of babying, hardly any, if any at all, uh, pesticides, synthetic, synthetic fertilizers don't need it. Once they're, if they're planted in the right spot and they get established, they need very little, if any, supplemental water which saves you money, brings, brings the birds and the bees to your backyard. Really wonderful to enjoy native pollinators and, and birds in your yard. Oops. Oops. And they're beautiful. I think that's under, I think that is overlooked in many cases. So the nine bark on top, gorgeous red stems, cute little white flowers and 
all sorts low and uh, and tall organ grape. Wonderful species, wonderful garden species, so useful for seasons of interest. I do recommend. Planting for success is kind of, this is broadly applicable to, you know, planting uh, ornamental species, so things that aren't native as well, so which many of us gardeners will be familiar with. Right plant, right place, you know, matching, matching the soil and other climatic conditions in a certain place with plants, you know, that, that's the, that's the skill. Um, in terms of planting, fall or winter, also spring is nice, <laughs> but yeah, you know, fall or winter is tends to be the best planting time because things are going into dormancy and they kind of just like, you know, spring comes, they wake up and they're like, oh, I like being here. This is great. Um, to make sure you get things in the right plant, right place, observe, observe wherever you're gardening, observe, uh, take lots of notes, do lots of sketches. I know, or I'm a designer, so I'm always, I'm always uh, sketching and I'm always asking myself, you know, why is that plant doing so well there? And I'll make note of that. Oh yeah, okay. So that plant will tolerate some dry shade. Okay, I'll tuck that away for future plant purchases. Microclimates are quite the feature of you know, natural areas as well, um, but urban areas, there's lots of things that create different niches. Uh, houses and buildings and fences, they can move wind, they can change wind patterns around, they can uh, retain heat. So um, retaining walls and large rocks, they can act as a, they have that good thermal mass. So they take in heat and they release it during the nighttime that can help keep some of your uh, more tender plants a little bit warmer. The bottom side of a retaining wall, especially if it's north facing, tends to be really cool and damp. Maybe a good place for some ferns. Uh, raised beds, the soil in them will heat up and it'll cool down. Uh, so it'll heat up earlier in the season and it'll cool down earlier in the season. So uh, it's more extreme. Terraces and slopes can affect how water moves around. On a slope, water will move through quicker, whereas in a lowland flat, flat area, water will stick around a little bit longer. Paved gravel surfaces, things like showy milkweed love a gravel mulch. So that can be a nice little microclimate for it. And of course, we all, I think most of us are familiar with like the phenomenon when you have a big conifer and it sucks up all the water and casts a bunch of shade. <laughs> So it creates its own little microclimate under the tree canopy. And when we're planting, let's think about, as opposed to just individual plants, let's think about plant communities and taking nature walks can give you an idea for what these native plant communities are. You can play with that, um, but think about assemblages of plants. So here we have um, an overstory I uh, can't really tell, but I see some conifer in the background. Then I see a vine maple, a mid canopy layer, healthy lush sword fern. And then I see some, um, it looks like a little bit of so on the on the ground layer. Not sharp boundaries, just things kind of blend into, e into each other. Really aesthetically pleasing for a naturalistic look that way. So plant selection, like I said, you're taking lots of notes, you're considering the yard conditions and it's okay like to be a little bit frivolous with our planting. So they, we just can't know all of the information about a certain place. We can do soil tests, we can do, um, you know, we do uh, percolation tests to see how, you know, how much water will um, stick around a certain area, but you know, we just gotta try some stuff out. So have fun and experiment. It's it, gardening is is a lifelong journey, um, and we've got lots of resources to to help you out on that journey. Native plant database, East Multnomah plant Portland plant list, really long document broken down by um, plant community, which I really like. I really like how it's broken down. And King County up in uh, Washington State has some sample planting plans, which are broadly applicable to our area as well. So there'll be a list of websites at the end. Spacing, 
don't plant shrubs that are going to get 10 feet wide, two feet on center. You want to be able to step back and visualize how things are going to grow and, and try and be patient. Uh, if you're doing it in stages, maybe you're doing it with a budget, um, or it's just generally a good idea to start with larger trees and shrubs, get those established first, and then fill in with ground covers. Though I will say, if you've got a big, a big area and you've got the budget, just like pack in the ground cover. It's like reduces maintenance, it's super nice. Here's some gorgeous photos of some, of some deciduous and evergreen trees. Big leaf maple, uh, I, think that, I, can't, I think that's a the Doug fir, Western red cedar, alder, incense cedar, vine maple, um, the crab apples, dogwoods, twin berries, uh, elderberries, tons of great options for a year round interest. I lo I'm loving right now the red twig dogwood before everything leaves out. Shrubs, all the, all, lots of great resources, the native plant booklet for Willamette Valley Yards. That's a good thing to thumb through. And of course, flowers, perennials, ferns, grasses, rushes, sedges. Well, one of my favorite, the shooting star. I'm not sure if this is Poets or Henderson shooting star, but gorgeous little flower that comes up in the bulb that comes up in the spring. And especially when things are getting established, it's important to have a good watering routine. Mulching in the fall is a good idea to um, prevent weeds. You can mulch in the spring too uh, to suppress some of the weeds. And weed early and often, the bigger it gets, the harder it is to remove. And there's so much more to learn. There's so much more to talk about. I hope you all will attend another um, another workshop, maybe Naturescaping Basics or Rain Garden 101, taught by fabulous uh, contract presenters for East Multnomah. Wonderful folks, uh, beneficial insects as well. We've got lots of useful websites on East Multnomah's uh, page, also City of Portland, King County, as I mentioned before. The Portland plant list, which is what I kept mentioning, uh, which has got the weeds list at the end. That's the best with weeds list in terms of like number of species listed that I found. <clears throat> um, invasive plant fact sheets, not super regionally specific, but you can kind of go in depth with some of these other weeds. So that's kind of cool. If you spot kudzu, call 1-800-INVADER. Don't be messing around. Call them. <laughs> and like I said, attend our other workshops. So that's all I have for you today. So I got one question coming in. Is there any prohibition on nurseries selling noxious weeds? Yes, I think for the noxious weeds, I'm pretty sure there are. But there are a lot of things that fly under the radar. A lot of gardeners, um, you know, trading plants amongst themselves. So, you know, it's not, not like it's a foolproof system. I am personally annoyed at the amount of, um, oh, what is it? The cherry laurel that's, that's sold. Lots of, yeah, it's still sold widely in nurseries. Um, yeah, there's, there's a couple others that I'm just annoyed and I'm not really sure why there isn't more regulation on it. So there's some, there's some restrictions, but in my opinion, not enough. All right. Okay. So is there anything in the chat? So I'm just gonna look at the chat. Oh, I see. Yes. Questions, comments afterwards, email fixitfair at portlandoregon.gov and, um, more resources at that, that link tree. <laughs>